Now, I mentioned before that the concept of macroevolution is uh, somewhat concerned with the idea of the development of new species, how one ancestral species can branch into two species afterward, and you know how do new species get generated. The first thing that you want to know about the concept of a species, though, is that it's a little bit of a man-made concept. We as humans like to come up with categories in which to put things. It helps us organize the world around us. But two organisms that are closely related to each other, are they the same species or are they different subspecies or are they different species entirely? Those are determinations that biologists have to kind of decide on a case by case basis. For instance, are different breeds of dogs different species? I mean, they look very, very different from each other. Uh, and in many cases, you would think, well, those two dogs probably couldn't uh, breed together. They're, they're kind of reproductively isolated from each other. So you have a Great Dane and a, and a Chihuahua. But are they different enough to be considered two different species? That's for us to decide, essentially. It's kind of a man-made concept. Organisms exist as they are. We're the ones that put them into these categories. In the case of dogs, we just consider all domestic dogs to be a single species. You could make a pretty powerful argument that different types of dogs maybe are different enough that you could divide them, but I don't know it would be a very useful classification, so you know why bother with that? So when we talk about the idea of a species, we need to have a definition in mind. And what I'm going to use is the biological species concept. It's called the biological species concept. And it's kind of the common sense view of what a species is. Here's what it says. A group of natural populations whose member have the potential to interbreed and produce fertile offspring. That is, two organisms are of the same species if they could breed together create offspring, and those offspring are not a genetic dead end. Those offspring could themselves then create more offspring and so on and so forth. If two organisms are closely related enough to breed, then we should consider them the same species. But what do we mean by closely related enough to breed? What do we mean by this idea? So for example, here are two different bird species. Uh, one is called the Western Meadowlark, and the other is the Eastern Meadowlark. And as you might expect, the territory of the Eastern Meadowlark is Eastern, it's on the Eastern side. Uh, and then the territory of the Western Meadowlark is a little bit more Western. And they're considered to be two different species, even though I could not tell you which one is which, unless I had very carefully placed these pictures on the left and right hand sides here. I mean, they look exactly the same to me. They behave the same, they're about the same size. Uh, and if they were to interbreed, they actually could produce viable offspring, but they never do interbreed, they never interact. Sometimes they show up in the same location, geographically, their, their ranges do overlap a little bit. But when they find themselves in the same location, they have different mating calls. Here's what the Western Meadowlark's mating call sounds like. And then here's the Eastern Meadowlark. That little difference in their mating call is enough to drive a wedge in between these two populations. Because the females of one species don't recognize the mating calls of the male of the other species, and vice versa, the males and females of these two species don't interact. So even though on a molecular level or on a cellular level they absolutely could interbreed and create fertile offspring, they simply do not. They're what we call behaviorally isolated from each other. They are not going to interbreed, so we consider them to be two different species. Now, the biological species concept is not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. For one thing, it's not going to apply to every single organism. So let's read it one more time. A group of natural populations whose members have the potential to interbreed and to produce fertile 
offspring. What if you have only one member of a species left? It's not a group of natural populations, it's, it's a single organism. So does this species concept apply? Generally, you don't worry about individuals of a species. You're talking about the entire kind of organism. So situations where there's only one left, it's just not the kind of question we're trying to answer with this definition. What if I have two dinosaur fossils, and I want to know whether or not they're of the same species? They look similar, maybe a little bit different from each other, but maybe these are two members of the same species. How would I know using this definition? There's really no way for me to figure it out. I would need to use a different definition of species in order to determine whether or not I think they were different enough to consider them two species or similar enough to consider them to be the same species. So it wouldn't work for that. Have the potential to interbreed. Not all organisms reproduce sexually, so not all organisms have the potential to interbreed. So, for instance, bacteria generally reproduce asexually. They do have a method of uh, trading genes back and forth. You could call that kind of sexual reproduction light, but they really reproduce asexually. So this uh, definition would be totally useless for classifying asexually reproducing organisms. Are two E. coli bacteria of the same species? Well, they can't interbreed, so this definition doesn't really hold a lot of water there. In these kinds of situations, we use a different species definition, an evolutionary species definition. And it's basically an argument. You're saying that this group of organisms is distinct enough. They represent a unique enough branch of the evolutionary tree that we should call them their own species. And here's all the unique things about them, and here's why I feel very, very strongly about this. But this kind of shows you what I mean when I say that the concept of species is a sort of man-made concept. We need to decide what our definition is before we can even figure out what it is that we're talking about. We say that one species can branch and create multiple different species. What we're really saying is that organisms can change enough to the point where a reasonable observer would agree that these are unique evolutionary lineages, they are, they are distinct enough organisms that we could apply one of our definitions for species to them. So why would a population of organisms, a single species, right, why would two groups of that population become different enough that they could no longer interbreed? There's actually several different ways that this could happen. Mutations can change any aspect of an organism, from what the shape of certain organs are to their behavior and mating practices, all kinds of interesting little details. So for one, a lot of organisms have mating seasons. They're only ready to reproduce at a specific time of year. And those mating seasons are often genetically determined. So little mutations in the control genes that decide when you are and are not ready to breed could make it so that two different subpopulations of this species start breeding at different times. So for instance, we have two spotted skunks here. I think most people would agree that they are probably very closely related organisms, and yet these two populations would not interbreed with each other. We have the western spotted skunk and the eastern spotted skunk. The western spotted skunk is only ready to breed in the autumn, and the eastern spotted skunk is only able to breed in the late winter. So these two populations are not ready to go at the same time. This is what we call being temporally isolated from each other. Some little mutation has offset the timing here, and now, going on into the future, unless something very substantially changes, these two populations are not going to be able to interbreed. The longer time proceeds with this reproductive barrier in place, the more and more differences these two populations are going to develop, because mutation is always at play. So they'll only become more different over time unless that barrier comes down for one reason or another. Other kind of barriers exist too. These are all reproductive barriers. So temporal isolation means that they are isolated from each other in time. They're not ready to reproduce at the same time. There's also habitat isolation. When a population spreads into a new area, then new traits are going to be fit for that area. So that population will change their phenotype to adapt themselves to those circumstances. Directional selection, right? But maybe the original population still exists as well with its original adaptations. 
This population is extremely well suited to dry climates, say this garter snake on the right, and another population might be extremely well suited to swampy freshwater kind of uh, conditions. So this other garter snake over here on the left. Since this one's always down in lowland areas and this one's always up in high dry areas, they're just never going to be in the same place at the same time. Even if you were to put them in the same location, one of them or both of them potentially would not be fit enough to survive. They wouldn't be healthy enough to have offspring. So they are habitat isolated. This is habitat isolation. Two organisms live in fundamentally different locations, so they're never going to have the opportunity to breed uh, and reproduce into the future. Behavioral isolation. We already saw this uh, with the meadowlarks, but here is a couple of birds called blue-footed boobies. And over here on the left, we have the male. Over here on the right, we have the female. They look very similar to each other. The male is performing a mating dance, a mating dance of the blue-footed boobies. And if he does this mating dance supremely well, then the female will consent uh, to reproduction. That will be her mate for that particular season. That mating dance is genetically controlled, just like the meadowlark's song is. It's instinctual. It doesn't need to be taught. Now, the mating dance is not super complicated, but if he doesn't get all of the moves correct, she's not going to select him for mating. So he's got to make sure he's got this right. So let's see if we got this dance going. We got, you got to lift up your feet, lift up your feet, right? Back and forth, back and forth. Then you got to do a little bit of a bow, I believe. Let's see here. Yeah, there's the bow. You got to get your wings spread out for a bow. Uh, there's a... Uh, and if she enjoys it, she's going to come over and do the dance as well. So she'll start participating here. Now, if some mutation comes through, which causes a particular population of boobies to have a slightly different mating dance, maybe they got some more wing flaps going in their dance than the other ones, well, the original population is not going to be interested in them, but they might form their own breeding groups. So that's behavioral isolation, another reason why two organisms might be reproductively isolated from each other. What next? Mechanical isolation. Mechanical isolation. So, uh, uh, not to be crass, but there are a lot of different... Uh, tools out there in the animal kingdom for delivering one set of gametes to another set of gametes. And not all of those tools are compatible. Not all of those organs are compatible with each other. If two sets of reproductive organs simply don't fit together, we say that those organisms are mechanically isolated from each other. Maybe they're compatible in some other way, but they can never deliver their gametes together, so they're not going to have any offspring. Here we have two snails uh, that have the wrong chirality for one another. Chirality has to do with left-right symmetry. You see, snails are hermaphrodites, true hermaphrodites. They have male and female sex organs. And if you interact with another snail that has the same setup, that's fine, because when you face each other, you can match up organs to organs, male organs to female organs, female organs to male organs, and the whole thing works. If you take a look at that snail shell on top, you can see that the whorl of a snail shell goes off to one side. But both of these snails in this image, their whorls are facing toward us, which means that they're mirror images of each other. Because of this, they don't have the right compatibility. Their organs aren't going to line up properly, and they are mechanically isolated from each other. So they're not going to be able uh, to reproduce. What's next on our docket of reproductive isolation mechanisms, reproductive barriers? Well, let's say that two organisms have made it through all of the barriers we've discussed so far. So, they are not temporarily isolated from each other. They're ready to mate at the same time. They are found in the exact same location, so there's no habitat isolation. They have the same behaviors. They understand each other's mating calls and mating dances, and they're ready to go at the same time. Uh, they're not mechanically isolated. Their organs fit together properly. They might still be gametically isolated, though. In order for fertilization to occur, 
a sperm needs to come into contact with an egg cell and they need to do a kind of chemical handshake. Protein receptors on the surface of each cell have to recognize each other in order to allow fertilization to continue. And proteins are coded for by DNA and DNA is subject to mutation. So those receptors can change shape to the point where the two sets of receptors aren't going to recognize each other. So in gametic isolation, even though everything else might be going right, the sperm and the egg cells just don't recognize each other. So those two populations are more or less permanently reproductively isolated from each other because the gametes of one are incompatible with the gametes of another. Here we have some sea urchins of different colors. Uh, each sea urchin just kind of emits its gametes out into the water, its external fertilization, they just release it out into a cloud and they hope for all the cells to find each other. But even though the red sea urchins are breeding in this area and the blue sea urchins are breeding in this area, they're all sending their gametes out, only red sperm are going to fertilize red eggs and only blue sperm are going to fertilize blue eggs as a result. So that's another possible reason why one population could divide into two permanent populations. Now, let's say you got through all of those barriers, every single one of them. They were compatible enough to breed and fertilization went through, so we got a fertilized zygote. So those are the same species, right? Not quite. Uh, if you remember the definition, there was one little bit at the end that sounded a little bit weird. A group of natural populations who have the capacity to interbreed and produce fertile offspring together. So their offspring can't be a genetic dead end. But here we have two different species of large cat. They're in the same genus. We have Panthera leo and Panthera tigris. I think I have that right. Uh, and one is found only in jungles. The tiger is a very large cat found in jungles. The lion is a slightly sm slightly smaller cat found in the savanna. Uh, they would be habitat isolated from each other. They don't show up in the same locations, but they do get together in zoos periodically. And as it turns out, lions and tigers are similar enough that if they were to breed, you would get a hybrid organism. You would get a liger or a tegon, depending on which one is the mother and which one is the father. It goes liger or tegon. Uh, now, would that mean, okay, so they can interbreed and produce offspring. Are they the same species, lions and tigers? Well, no, they're not because ligers are generally born sterile, so they can't have offspring of their own. They're a genetic dead end. There are other animals like this as well. For example, horses and donkeys can interbreed and they can produce offspring. That's how you get a mule, but you really can't breed two mules together to get another mule because mules are generally born sterile as well. So horses and donkeys, they're close enough, they're related enough to interbreed and have offspring, but they're not related enough to be considered the same species. And there were lots of, uh, I'll call them experiments, um, more like sideshow performances done for a, for a while there, where um, people would breed together all kinds of organisms, you know, a, a zebra and a horse, for instance, and they would be able to make some offspring. And typically this is what happens. The offspring have a lower fertility, reduced hybrid fertility. So this is another kind of reproductive barrier, but this is what we call a post-zygotic reproductive barrier. This occurs after the fertilization is successful, reduced hybrid fertility. 